Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is my name is Sharon McKinley, and I am the senior consultant with the NRC for In-Home Services, which is funded by the Department of Health and Human Services Children's Bureau. On behalf of NRC for In-Home Services, I'd like to welcome you to the Promoting Safe and Stable Families Peer Web Teleconference. Today's topic is Indian Child Welfare Act. Before we get started, uh, we would like to know who else is on the phone and um, let us know where you're calling from. So if you can state your name and what state you're calling from, we'll welcome you. And you can start from, um, from east to west if that helps. <laughs> I guess I'll go first. My name is Heather LaForm. I am from New York State Office of Children and Family Services. I am the Native American Services Special Assistant here. Okay. Thank you. I'm Linda Love. I am uh, with Catawba Indian Nation, Director of Social Services, Rock Hill, South Carolina. Welcome. Next, you want to introduce yourself? Anyone else? Yes, uh, I'm Roger DeRosier. I'm with the New Hampshire Division for Children, Youth, and Families, and I'm the uh, policy manager for the uh, division. Hi, it's Eileen West with the Children's Bureau. Hello. Hi, my name is Heidi Valdez, and I am in Salt Lake City, Utah. I work for uh, Division of Child and Family Services and also the CB CAP lead. Hi, I'm Carolyn Regula, formerly Carolyn Harvey with Iowa from the um, PSSF CFSR coordinator for the state. We're introducing ourselves, those who are just on the phone. Those who are just coming on the phone, we're introducing ourselves, please. Hi there, this is Natalie Powers with the Office of Children's Services in Alaska, and I'm the Policy Administrator for Child Welfare. Thank you. Welcome. This is Cindy Ruth from um, Nevada Division of Child and Family Services, and um, I work for this course. Hello, my name is Kevin Higgins. I work for the Child and Family Services Division in Montana. I am the Contracts and Grants Supervisor. Okay. Okay, anyone else want to introduce yourself? What state you're calling from? Person just, um, just entered. We are introducing ourselves and what state you're calling from, please. Daphne Billingsley from Tennessee. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if anyone else comes on, here I want to welcome you, and I thank you all for taking the time out to join us for this topic. Um, before we get started, we want to make sure that everyone can hear the presenter. So um, I would like for you all to please mute your phone, and you can do that by doing star six. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we will allow you to unmute your phone uh, once uh, everyone has presented, and you can ask questions, do comments, uh, share, which you also are doing in your state. I will um, send the materials out, the PowerPoint out, once the um, presentation is over. And also, I will be sending out a feedback form to you all so that we can hear from you to let us know uh, how we're doing and what other topics you would like for us to present on. Okay. All right. I would like to make a short announcement that uh, we are having our next uh, Promoting Safe and Stable web teleconference in March. 
And uh, we're planning to have it on um, promoting safe and stable family one-on-one. -on -one. This is like an intro, uh, an update on what's going on with promoting safe and stable families. Uh, we have some new people who have joined us, and so we want to make sure that everybody is aware about uh, what it is, what is promoting safe and stable families, and, and how what, that, what it's about. Okay. Uh, one more thing I forgot to announce. Also, we are also having our uh, annual grantee meeting on May the 2nd and 3rd um, at the Hyatt Regency in, uh, in D.C. And so if you haven't already, please mark your calendar and stay tuned. We'll be sending out notice about that pretty soon, uh, somewhere in the first part of, of, um, of the year. Now, for our facilitators for today, we have on as our presenter, Melissa Clyde. She is a Navajo and originally from Tohatchi, New Mexico. She has a master's degree in social work with a concentration in American Indian mental health on the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University um, in St. Louis, Missouri. She has a Bachelor's of Art in Sociology from University of Arizona. Her experience is in tribal child welfare services, including child protective services and case management. Melissa also has experience in children's mental health as a treatment coordinator for a nonprofit organization. As an MSW intern, Melissa did uh, restorative justice work from the St. Louis Family Court. And then we also have Betsy Tooley. Uh, she is an Indian Child Welfare Program Manager with Children's Administration uh, with the Department of uh, 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 Social Health and Services, I believe, in Washington State. She has worked for um, Children's Administration since 1992 in various capacities, including as a CPS, that's Child Protective Service Social Worker, a Primacy Program Manager, and also a Social Work Supervisor. And she has also been the Child Administrator Academy Trainer. Um, Bessie's primary focus is in all of these positions has been with Indian Child Welfare. Um, she is also prior working with, um, there she was also worked in United Indian, United Indian All Tribes Foundation as a uh, child welfare service case manager and foster care licensor. And then we have Lynn Craig, um, is currently the supervisor of Central Case Review Team, which is an essential component of quality insurance uh, for the Children's Administration uh, in Washington State. Uh, she has over 23 years uh, with, the, with the Washington Department of Social Health Services. And as a social worker, she has been a supervisor as well as a quality insurance manager, and she has her master's degree in family counseling. So I thank Melissa, Betsy, and Lynn for taking time to be the presenters for today. So I'm going to turn um, the uh, teleconference now over to Melissa, and she can um, begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and uh, thank you to all the participants on the call from east to west. And also, uh, thank you to the part, our partners at the National Resource Center for In-Home Services and the Children's Bureau for joining us for this um, important topic on the Indian Child Welfare Act. And um, it, you know, this topic is very important to us um, at the National Indian Child Welfare Association. And so I know you all have an interest in putting your minds together to see what life we can build um, for our Indian children. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to share today with our partners at Washington State. I'm just going to give you a general context of the cultural history of the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, legislative history, um, some legal requirements under ICWA. I won't go into a lot of details of that just for time for timing reasons. Um, but most importantly, I wanted you to hear more from the state of Washington and the, the good work that is happening there 
around um, the compliance of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Next slide, please. So I wanted to set, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to set the tone here for our conversation here that the protection of Indian children is very critical to tribal communities. Uh, children historically um, are seen as um, important future leaders of the tribe. Uh, children are highly valued for the potential services that they can offer to the tribe in the future. Uh, children um, are, can become citizens of their own community. Um, Indian children uh, potentially can become the, the tribe's future elected president or chair, chairperson. Uh, Indian child can have a right to run for office, access an education in their language and community, or receive benefits um, through land, scholarships, medical, and cultural services if they're available in the tribe. So for tribal child welfare, um, the com tribal community has a very strong value of, uh, of children in their, in, who, belong, um, of, who belong to their nation. Next slide. Historically, uh, tribal um, uh, child abuse was rare in tribal communities. Um, uh, children in tribal communities are seen as gifts from the creator. Um, there's a strong existence of extended family systems in tribal communities. They are seen as resources to uh, parents and children. Typically, um, um, child community standards are um, in place to help care for children to keep them safe. In tribal communities, child rearing and discipline is part of the spiritual belief system of the community, and this is still common in tribal communities. It helps to enhance um, the protective factors in, in family. For example, over the weekend, uh, my family and I celebrated um, my Nolly. Um, um, her first laugh. I'm a grandmother, believe it or not, at my age, but um, we celebrated her first laugh um, among family and friends, and, um, and it's a teaching opportunity for us to bring uh, family and relatives together to remind ourselves about the importance of child protection in our, in our family. Next slide, please. I wanted to share with you all that um, in tribal communities, there exist many different types of community supports to help enhance the protection of children. And the role of, um, <clears throat> of programs and services operating the Promoting uh, Safe and Stable uh, Families um, Funds um, have an opportunity to utilize these different community supports to enhance the protection of children. In tribal communities, there's a strong emphasis on um, relationships through uh, clan, uh, community membership, um, tribal connections, border tribal connections as well. Also in tribal communities, just within the environment, there are many various protective factors that exist. Sometimes um, having access to sacred sites for spiritual reasons are, are available. Um, different tribal agencies and departments and programs are oftentimes led by their own tribal um, members and are able to provide the appropriate support and, and teachings and protocols to help support families who, who need the support. Also in tribal communities, what is also available are oftentimes natural helpers and healers, as well as access to traditional ceremonies. Um, I wanted to also in indicate, next slide please, that um, um, there are other protections in tribal communities um, for neglect. Um, in tribal communities, um, the, the, the value of, of protection is that the whole, the child belongs to the entire community. Um, tribes have various teachings on behavior expectations and relationships and social, social interactions to really describe roles and responsibilities in terms of how um, individuals um, are expected to take care of, of children within their community. And that also being extended to um, 
uh, family members and community members. Um, for example, um, it is very common um, for a family member or a designated tribal elder to step in um, to take care of children if, uh, if parents have had passed on. And it's also um, very common for uh, family members or um, um, highly valued individuals in tribal communities to step forward to take care of children when their parents are, uh, are unable to do that. Next slide, please. I wanted to um, just briefly highlight that there are some challenges and barriers that have broken up Indian families. Um, and those were created by federal policies. Um, and I've only highlighted a few of them that really have um, set the, the, for child welfare, um, these federal policies um, of the 1900s created a trend of bringing children from their families and communities. And that being, for example, the Indian Adoption Project, which was um, conducted in the 1950s and led by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Indian Affairs and the Child Welfare League of America, um, there was a wave of, of, of practice in the field of social work that um, um, promoted the removal of children at this time. Also in the time period of the 1950s and the, and the 60s, 60s was a relocation program. And in this particular program, um, individuals were, um, tribal members were given a one-way bus ticket and a few bucks um, to metropolitan areas, um, to um, places like Denver, San Francisco, Minneapolis, Seattle, LA, Phoenix, and Portland, Oregon, for example, um, and trying to um, kind of disperse uh, um, relatives families um, to, um, um, in different locations. While these different federal policies were in place and um, um, breaking up families and, and children were being removed, um, tribes began to question the placement rates of their children into non-Indian homes also starting in the 1960s. Next slide. So based on that questioning from tribes, um, things started to change in the 1970s, not very long ago. Um, the Association on American Indian Affairs conducted a survey and um, project to identify um, and to take a closer look at the extent of the Indian child welfare issues from the 1960s and 70s. And through a study, they had found um, that about 20 to 35 percent of all Indian children had been removed from their families and placed in, in some type of care outside of their communities. Eighty-five percent of those um, Indian children were placed in non-Indian homes or institutions outside of their communities. And currently in this, in this current age, um, some of these rates are still the same and sometimes have gotten worse. Next slide, please. And because of those alarming rates of the removal of children, um, the Indian Child Welfare Act came into place in response um, out of the evidence that was conducted out of that report um, that um, um, it was, uh, the report was provided to Congress. And um, therefore, uh, Congress took a, had a deep concern about the removal of Indian children from their communities and therefore passed the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978, which is a federal law and policy. The Indian Child, next slide please. The Indian Child Welfare Act is pretty unique because um, what it does is it sets up and um, promotes the unique legal relationships that the United States government has with Indian people. Um, it acknowledges through the Indian Child Welfare Act um, sovereign nations that tribes have um, and, it, and it allows to um, promote Congress's responsibility to regulate commerce with Indian tribes, um, which then um, the responsibility of the federal government is to um, protect and preserve um, tribes and their resources. Next slide, please. <clears throat> One of the resources that Congress definitely acknowledged was that um, in this quote it says that there is no resource 
that is more vital to the continued existence and integrity of Indian tribes than their children. And this is the, the primary um, intention of the Indian Child Welfare Act is to ensure that children have connections to um, their tribal nation. Next slide, please. What the Indian Child Welfare, Welfare Act does is it establishes um, minim, minimum federal standards for state, for state removal of Indian children from their families. Um, its intentions is to help decrease the number of Indian children um, placed in non-Indian homes or institutions. And it allows tribes uh, or Indian tribes to operate um, child, child and family programs. Next slide. One of the great things um, about the Indian Child Welfare Act is that it really clearly defines um, um, and allows a tribe to define uh, permanency outcomes for their children. Um, the primary precedent is to ensure that a child um, has a sense of belonging to their Indian culture, and it allows them to have access to their families. Uh, extended relatives, whether they have um, a connection to a clan, um, and and the Indian Child Welfare Act is uh, uh, created to allow a child to have those um, an opportunity to have connections to these very important individuals to help uh, develop a sense of of, of 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 identity. Next slide. Some of the key provisions of the Indian Child Welfare Act is that it sets up requirements and standards for child placing agencies to follow a pla the placement preference of Indian children. It requires um, states, um, um, non-Indian tribal communities to, um, to provide appropriate um, cultural services for Indian families before and after out-of-home placement occurs. So there is a, a high expectation of active efforts on uh, tribal um, uh, uh, for these uh, child-placing agencies. And I'll allow the, our partners in Washington State to describe um, what work they are doing um, in this area. The Indian Child Welfare Act also has a clear expectation that if there is an Indian child who enters in the state system that a notice to the tribe and parents um, they, that must be sent to them to inform them about the placement of, of this Indian child. In the, the Indian Child Welfare Act also um, um, requires that um, Indian children be placed in relative or in Indian home. Next slide. I just wanted to um, briefly highlight um, some um, critical information around active efforts and what that means. Um, active efforts is pretty, um, it can be a, a best practice um, for any child or family who enters into um, a, a, the state system. Um, we hope that children as well as Indian children um, are provided services that allows um, them to have an early and active engagement with their tribe. Um, that services are go beyond just a referral. Um, that um, social workers are working directly with families and providing them the support to ensure that they can get to the services that are helpful to them to keep um, a child safe in their home. Oh, um, that in addition that there is a proactive engagement in case management that there are um, the family has an opportunity to describe uh, what services they need and a social worker finding ways to ensure that the family has the appro cultural, appropriate cultural services provided to them um, with the appropriate connection. The Indian Child Welfare Act goes beyond the minimum requirements set by policy um, to meet the needs of children and families. Next slide. The Indian Child Welfare Act um, does something else that is um, pretty empowering for tribes. Um, it allows tribes to reassume jurisdiction over uh, child welfare matters. So it allows tribes to develop codes around um, juvenile courts. Um, they, they can 
establish their own tribal standards and develop their child welfare programs and services. And um, today, almost all Indian tribes are in a position, if not, are providing services to their own children. So just a few things about ICWA. Um, the, one of the important things um, social workers look at are determining if this is if the family and the child that they're working with is the child an Indian. Um, so if if the, what it, the Indian Child Welfare Act defines um, Indian child as a, a, the child is unmarried under the age of 18, is a member of a federally recognized tribe or eligible for membership and the bi biological child of a member of an Indian tribe. Um, um, and uh, social workers are required to um, inquire the status of an Indian child um, if, if there is reason to believe the child is Indian. And in the state of Washington, um, they have a higher standard for that. Um, I, I think this is important for um, anyone working with families in the state setting and working with Indian families that um, just um, Indian children, uh, or for ICWA, ICWA does not cover placements where parents or Indian um, custodians can have the child returned upon request. Um, um, it doesn't um, apply to divorce proceedings. And um, ICWA does not cover most juvenile delinquency proceedings. Um, and ICWA does apply to placements based on status offenses. I wanted to just spend the last few minutes um, going through some, um, um, some things around ICWA where um, no foster placement um, may be ordered with evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, that continued custody of a child by the parent is likely to result in a serious emotional or, or physical damage to the child. So the important piece about active efforts for social workers is to provide uh, remedial services to prevent the family breakup, and um, those services should be provided prior to and after removal of the child. Here is just a slide of the placement preferences, um, and um, you can look at that after. Next slide, please. Um, and I thought it was important to um, show here that under ICWA, um, the termination of parental rights may not um, be ordered without clear and convincing evidence, which is a higher standard, um, for the continued custody of a child by the parent um, is likely to result in serious emotional or physical damage to the child. And again, this is just a higher um, expectation to provide active efforts to the family. Next slide. Next slide. I wanted to highlight that one of the unique things that the Indian Child Welfare Act pro promotes is um, the use of expert witnesses. And oftentimes, people get hung up in this area um, because um, the Indian Child Welfare Act defines a qualified expert witness um, um, beyond uh, just the normal social work social work um, experience. The tribes have an opportunity to um, determine who are expert witnesses um, um, for their community. And um, these expert witnesses can be tribal me members um, knowledgeable about family dynamics, the way family systems are structured, and about child rearing practices. Oftentimes, um, expert wit witnesses can be um, lay experts um, with experience in, in Indian child and family services. Um, and they can be professionals um, with experience in, the, in their own field. Sharon, if you could skip um, the next two slides, I think that will save us some time. I wanted to just close um, with some challenges um, um, for tribes and states who are um, working um, to, in, to become better at complying with the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, for tribes in particular, funding definitely um, is inadequate. 
Um, tribes are finding ways to um, provide programs and services that are driven by um, their communities and with recent legislation have an opportunity to um, um, get better and provide the, the child welfare services they need. Um, not all tribes have resources to develop their own services, but again, those things are getting better over time. And that one of the other challenges for tribes is when it comes to Indian child welfare cases, they may not be able to quickly respond um, when a state sends a notice. And, and for various reasons, for workforce and for timing issues, oftentimes that has become a barrier for tribes. And for states, um, I do recognize that it is difficult to recruit Indian homes. Um, and. Um, and there, there's an ongoing need and desire for um, child welfare workers to become trained on ICWA and culturally um, competent practices. Um, and, and, and also, um, we have recognized um, nationally that workers are successful when agencies give clear guidance and monitor compliance, which you will hear from our partners at Washington State in terms of how they're doing that. But it, just in closing, um, um, I wanted to just um, close by saying that with the benefits of compliance of the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, you become um, proactive in helping um, a family and a child um, stay connected and um, provide support to the children so that they have that sense of connection to their community. Um, and, and with good compliance, it also means that workers are doing a good job with child welfare practice and looking at the best interests of Indian children. I have cited a couple of um, important um, references in my slides here um, around um, that are good read for um, you um, over your spare time. But um, I just wanted to thank you for your time and wanted to allow time for my um, partners to um, share um, with you um, what they're doing in Washington State. And I will turn it over to Lynn and Betsy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melissa, for that really great presentation. Some great information there. Um, Lynn and I, are, as uh, Melissa noted, are going to present on how we do some things in Washington State. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with the first few slides. Again, my name is Betsy Tooley. I'm an enrolled member of the Macaw Nation, which is a tribe here in Washington State, and I've been doing Indian child welfare for a few years now. Uh, one thing, uh, next slide, please. One thing, uh, in Washington State, uh, we have a strong commitment to honoring our government-to-government -government relationship with each of the 29 federally recognized tribes, from the governor on down to all of our state workers and this is in different fields, including Children's Administration, Child Welfare Services. We also work with uh, Indian organizations, uh, and we value our work with uh, tribes that are outside of the state of Washington, including Canada. One of the vehicles that we utilize to implement our government-to-government -government work is the Indian Policy Advisory Committee. The IPAC is a group of tribal delegates that are uh, delegated by tribal resolution. So it is clear that they have the authority to speak on behalf of the tribe. And they meet actually with the state on a quarterly basis for all DSHS work, and that includes child welfare, juvenile rehabilitation, drug alcohol services, all the different issues. Uh, in children's, we then have a subcommittee at, at which we meet on a monthly basis. And this is a really helpful work group. We have tribal participation, and we're able to work with them to uh, communicate any policy or legislative changes, to engage tribes in helping us develop and implement policy and legislative uh, initiatives, uh, uh, work through issues of concern, maybe when there's a breakdown, many different things. We have a full agenda every month that we work with tribes on, and as well as uh, what we call recognized American Indian organizations. We have six of those Indian organizations in this they, they don't have the same government-to-government -government status, of course, as our tribes, but we still value our work with them as they serve a lot of our Indian population that are off-reservation. Uh, the other thing in Washington State is that we have tribal state agreements. Uh, 
actually much of the work, in fact, some of the folks at NICWA, where Melissa works, were very much involved in development of uh, policies, administrative codes, and initiation of tribal state agreements even prior to the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act. So we have those tribal state agreements that help guide our service delivery and how we work with tribes in this state. Each tribe, as most of you know, uh, is unique. Their governmental structures may be different. They may have different infrastructure when it comes to child welfare service delivery. Some have a vast, wide array of services, whereas others, smaller tribes, may have a very small infrastructure. So we work with each tribe uh, and meet them where they're at. And uh, so these tribal state agreements, um, which we you know, the authority actually comes from the Constitution, but the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act also mentions that states have the authority to enter into tribal state agreements with each tribe. So we implement that, and actually a few years ago, we consulted with tribes on a formal consultation basis and developed a template so that we can develop individual tribal state agreements with each of the tribes that wants to enter into one of those in Washington State. Um, and it's very helpful. For instance, who wants to do the CPS investigation if there's an allegation of abuse of a tribal child? Will the state do it? Will the tribe do it? Or will we work together in collaboration when we go out to investigate those uh, abuse allegations, those type of things? Just basically who's going to do what? Also, tribes are able to access our services in the state of Washington while they're tribal members. They're also citizens of Washington State. So we in Washington State recognize that they're eligible for all services that in kind with every other child in this state. So we kind of work through that in our agreements with tribes uh, to go through that. Kind of went a little bit long on there. So we probably better move on. Sorry. Next slide. Um, when we implement, you know, so this is basically what I just spoke to. Uh, a lot of the uh, implementation of the government-to-government -government relationship is, is listed on this slide here. We, we, utilize, uh, we work with tribes for implementation of policy and programs, uh, as well as improving our compliance with the federal in, and state Indian Child Welfare Acts. And we work with tribes to reduce disproportionality, dis disproportional representation of Indian children in our system. So usually we, we will have a work group with targeted people who can, where we collaborate with tribes and organizations to implement these activities. Next slide, please. Uh, in Washington State, in uh, June of 2011, the, Indian, uh, the Washington State Indian Child Welfare Act became law. It actually closely mirrors the federal Indian Child Welfare Act, but there are uh, there are a little more. There's a little bit more to the Washington State Indian Child Welfare Act. For instance. Um, uh, it defines more clearly what active efforts are and in best interests of the Indian child. It requires a good faith effort for determination of the child's Indian status uh, and uh, defines who could be considered an a, a, a expert witness and also clarifies that we don't just contact the child's tribe that the child's primarily connected to, but to all tribes that a child may be a member or eligible for membership in. So next slide, please. Um, thank you. OK, thanks. Lynn's going to take over here. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I do, one of the things that the actual the state uh, ICW Act um, also includes is that there's an ongoing quality assurance process within the state of Washington. So I uh, am the supervisor of the uh, statewide uh, case review team. And we do uh, a lot of different reviews. But one of the reviews that we're committed to do is an, an Indian Child Welfare case review on a biannual basis. So we have completed, we completed our first review in 2007. We did our second review in 2009. And now we're just uh, completing our third review. And the purpose of our case review is to uh, make sure that we are first in compliance with the federal ICWA as well as the state ICWA that was enacted in 2011, as Betsy just said, also with Washington State Tribal Agreements, and then our own 
ICW policies within Children's Administration. And so what we did is develop a tool to do um, quality assurance with. And one of the things that we really value about this tool is that it's not just a case review tool. It's a tool that involves a lot of reference of policy and the actual act. And it's used to be, um, it's really used to be a developmental tool for social workers and supervisors to understand the basic requirements of the act in our policy and how to, and what actions are needed to, um, to make sure that we are in compliance and also doing a quality social work practice with, for our Indian children. So it's a, it's a case review tool, but it's also a developmental tool meant to increase knowledge and understanding of Indian child welfare within our state. Okay, next slide. Okay. Oh, snazzy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're really proud of this ICW case review. I, I happen to be involved with the process from the very beginning. So I'd just like to speak to a little bit to the history. Other states might have heard about it or be interested in maybe developing something similar um, in their own state. Uh, it is very much based on collaboration with tribal partners. And Betsy talked about our IPAC um, advisory committee. A lot of the work in the development of the ICW case review um, went through the uh, IPAC committee. And so we began this process of collaboration. It started way back in 2005 to develop the tool. What would the process look like? Um, and it took us two years to really get through that. We actually did a pilot. And it was just a very uh, comprehensive process. And it was very much a tribal state process together. It was not just the state saying, OK, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. It really brought in the tr tribal representatives to assist us and to understand what was important to them and what they wanted included in this process. Um, we did the first review in 2007. We did the second review using the same tool in 2009. And then in our state, as Betsy mentioned, we passed our own Washington State ICWA. So we spent a, uh, we had a work group. We spent some time updating the tool. And so we didn't do the next review in 2011 as planned. We actually um, delayed it. And we just completed it in 2012. And when we did the update, it was making sure we brought in the new language from the Washington State ICWA and, and learning from what didn't work so well in the previous tool to try to make improvements, maybe add some new questions that we thought were missing, um, that type of thing. Uh, next slide. So our principles is that this is a collaborative effort, that we're partnering with our tribes and Indian organizations, that the process is not just to do an audit, but it, the whole process is based on increasing staff knowledge and understanding of Indian child welfare, um, and to improve our practice to meet the interests of Indian children. When something's working well in an office or an area of the state, we want to share what they're doing, what is working. And we also want to identify system barriers. So if there are things that are statewide not working, um, if they have to do with forms or trainings or different barriers where social workers are not getting the knowledge or information they need, we want to identify those barriers and try to create some kind of uh, improvement from that. Next slide, please. Our review team uh, includes a blended team of Viewers. So if many of you are probably uh, familiar with the CFSR and how they sort of operate, well, we bring in a blended, what we call a blended team. It's not just state people or my team actually doing the case review. We bring in representatives from our tribes, from our recognized American Indian organizations. We bring CA social workers from the field, supervisors, program managers, administrators, um, we, in our state, have an Office of Indian Policy, uh, and we bring in some of those managers, and then the central case review team that I supervise. So it's a blended team, and we have tribal representatives part of each review, which I think is a really important aspect of the team. Next slide. 
the IPAC actually assists us to identify um, tribal representatives that will be part of our case review. In the 2012 review that we just completed, we had uh, 14 tribal participants, so 14 folks from different tribes around the state that came to our case review. Um, our state is geographically large, so we had uh, actually six, we did the review in six locations, so we had six teams. And each team would have around 10, between 10 and 12 folks at each location. Um, so each of the folks, whether they came from our own children's administration or from tribes, they all came in with some knowledge um, on understanding of ICW. They had at least two years' experience working with Indian families within an Indian child welfare um, situation. They we provide a day-long training to orient them to the tool and our process and how it works. Um, they're acknowledged to be very culturally responsive in their social work practice, and they're coming in um, as recognized as folks that have a, an open and collaborative approach. And it, you know, it has worked really well in the tribal representatives that have joined us. There's been a lot of tribal leadership to really that really uh, confirms this process as a very um, positive process, and tribal leaders that communicate. This is not a gotcha process to go in and review the state, tell the state you know, what they're doing wrong. It's a very collaborative, meant to be a learning process. So the, the tribal representatives that we've had come in have really come in with that sort of um, attitude and approach. And one of the really nice things is that we really learn from each other. We sit in a room together for a week, and we listen to different points of view, and we just walk away with a much greater appreciation and understanding of the point of view of the other person, whether you're your state or from the tribe. Um, and so that's sort of one of the side benefits, I think, is that it's really had an impact in um, a better collaborative approach across the state since we began in working together. So um, we did 217 cases in 2009. As I mentioned, we just finished the 2012 review, and we did just about the same number of cases. They're done in six locations across the state. Um, the reviews take four days. They're comprised of about 10 to 12 people. Um, at the end of the, on the fourth day, we do an exit meeting with the um, area of the state, so they hear from us about what the preliminary findings were. Um, and that's really important because we make sure our tribal representatives are still with us when we do this exit meeting, and so their voices can be heard, and, and it can be a very, very powerful um, process for the state workers to hear, to hear this um, as we present this material together. Next slide. So I'm going to try to go a little faster here. Um, we do write a lot of reports, and we try to have practice improvement activities and action plans and all those things afterwards. So it's not just a process where you put together a lot of data, but that you're actually doing something with the data. Next slide. We cover eight areas of practice in our case review. This is just breaking down the eight areas of practice. There is uh, 30, I think it's 32 questions in the case review currently. And these are the areas that we break it down into. So next slide talks about inquiry of Indian status. And this is the first section. And this uh, looks at every case to make sure that we are asking the mother and the father regarding Indian ancestry. Every single case that Children's Administration opens, it is the expectation that we are uh, finding out from the mother and the father if they are available, if there's any Indian ancestry and that we're following up with inquiry to all tribes to determine Indian status. And we've added an element to not only are we doing this, but are we doing it timely when the case first opens. Next. The next area we talk about is our active efforts and collaboration with tribes. So we've talked a little bit already about active efforts. We break it down with mothers and fathers. Are, is there ongoing engagement with children? Are we contacting tribes right away to determine if they want to take jurisdiction um, of the case? 
And then also, is there ongoing consultation and collaboration with the child's tribe if the, ch if the case remains open to children's administration? Next slide. And we're um, also, Melissa mentioned in the ICWA how important it is to maintain cultural connections for Indian children. We have questions about do we see documentation that we've encouraged involvement of our Indian families in Indian resources and services that are available for their families. Um, for children that enter care, are we working to uh, ensure that children are placed in an Indian home? And if they're not, are there some efforts to maintain tribal customs and activities for that child? And then also support the child's contact with their parents and extended family. Next slide. Uh, we look at our dependency section is primarily looking at notification to tribes. Uh, one of the ICWA requirements is that, that tri all tribes are notified for fact-finding uh, termination hearings. And so we're looking for that documentation and also for those hearings where qualified expert witnesses utilize. Next slide. And this really plays, as you can tell, what Melissa was talking about, the requirements in the ICWA. And this is also following, uh, identifying and following the tribe's placement preference. And then the next slide. The next slides are really built off of the idea from the CFSR. We, whenever we do a case review, we want to look at our children safe, are their well-being needs being met, and are there active efforts to achieve permanency. So for safety, we divided it into two questions. Is the child safe when living in the family home? And if the child is removed in the last year, have they been safe in their out-of-home placement? And we, we place them in a home where they are safe. Uh, next slide. We break it well-being down into three questions. Are we um, identifying and meeting the child's education, physical health, or mental, mental and behavioral health needs? And then our last slide, um, next slide, is what are we doing for permanency for children that are placed in out-of-home care? During the last year, have we identified a uh, uh, permanent plan that meets the needs of the child? And are we taking steps right now to try to uh, achieve that permanent plan for the child? And I think I've stayed on time. <laughs> um, and so that's a little bit of what we're doing in Washington State. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Betsy and Melissa. Um, we're asking those who are online if you have any questions, comments, or if you would like to share what you are doing in your state in regards to Indian Child Welfare Act, please unmute your phone now. You can hit star six to unmute your phone, and please join in the conversation at this time. I, this is Daphne from Tennessee. Um, you're, um, we don't actually have recognized tribes in Tennessee right now, but I still would be interested in, is, there, is that tool that you use for the review uh, available online somewhere? It's, uh, I can send it to you. There's on, on the PowerPoint, I think if, you're, if you have that available to you, there's my email address. Okay. I will. I will be sending the um, PowerPoint out to everyone. They'll have it then. Okay. Uh -huh. And if you contact me by email, I'd be happy to send it to you. Okay. I, I think that's a good process. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? Anyone want to share? This is Linda Love in Rock Hill, Catawba Indian Nation. I thought it was an excellent presentation and I also could benefit from the um, handouts and the tools because in South Carolina, our state agencies are not asking, are they, are you, you know, is your child tribal? And we just need to start from scratch and this would be helpful. So if I could get it or use the PowerPoint as well, but I just wanted to say thank you. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. You can also send our policy if you'd like on on inquiry into Indian status. It's called so. Uh, okay. Maybe. 
Um, would you like my email, or is that something Sharon can do for us? Or? I can do that. Um, if, or you can email. I'm going to send the PowerPoint presentation, which has the information on there. All right. Um, however, you are free once you, you know, you can um, share uh, back and forth and call or email each other thereafter. And also, Lynn and Betsy, if, they, if there are any other handouts you would like to share, there might be some people who weren't on the call. Um, and if you have any other documents you want to share, you know, you can send it to me. And what we'll do is place it on the NRC and Home Services website as well as send it out to the individuals. Okay. Okay, will do. Okay. Anyone else? We welcome any anyone else is sharing what's going on in your state or if you have any questions. Then that's the offer, Melissa. Okay. Um, Sharon, this is Pam Day with the NRC. Melissa, do you also have some of those materials on the NICWA website? I was just curious about um, whether um, some of those tools might be available or if that might, is that something you all would normally have on your site? If not, we might be able to offer some links through Gateway or both. I mean, it could be linked from both sites. We have a lot of resources on the Indian Child Welfare Act on our website at www.nicwa.org. Mm -hmm. And then I think for the tools and resources that um, Lynn and Betsy shared are also on their website. I think I saw on the slide their website to um, right. access some of this information. So, um, Right. So I'm I, I'm just thinking between the NRC for in home and NICWA sure. and the state websites as well as information gateway. Hopefully, people can get um, a hold of any of these tools that are that that we know of um, that might be helpful. Yep. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, comments. I want to thank Lynn, Betsy, and Melissa for their time and excellent presentation for today. Um, we also would like to uh, remind everyone that we love to hear from you, feedback uh, in, in a form of fashion. We will be sending out a feedback form uh, and ask that you return it as soon as possible to me. <laughs> thank you all for being on the call today. You have a good, night. good afternoon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.